Now, as the title suggests, what we will mainly discuss tonight is how to achieve 1 million ringgit in your EPF account. Realistically, uh, how much you need to contribute every month considering the average savings in your age group. So we will go through several examples, a few different calculations. So it's going to be a bit of a heavy session tonight. Like hopefully you guys are prepared. As usual, this and more, uh, not financial or legal advice. So just a bit of an inspiring story over here. Like, okay, a few days ago, this guy posted on Facebook saying that his friend managed to save 1 million ringgit in his EPF account by the age of 45. So how do you do it? Well, a few things. Huh? First of all, he is currently working in the IT sector. He graduated in 23, started working, okay, began to let compound interest work for him. And the first thing is that he has a stable job with sufficient salary. Okay, this is quite important. Huh? If you feel that your current salary is not enough, huh, then it's going to be a bit of a problem because at the end of the day, what's working towards your EPF a balance is contributions. Okay? So make sure that you have a stable job, sufficient salary. Okay, secondly, he contributed more and more to his EPF account. Started with 11%, then raised it up to 12%, then 13%. His employer is also doing a bit of heavy lifting, though we do not know what is the percentage, but later I'll show you guys a few calculations. Thirdly, he did not touch his KWSB money unless absolutely needed. Okay. And the reason why he doesn't need to touch his KWSP money is because he has sufficient emergency funds. Okay. So if you hear about financial planning and financial planners, the first thing that I recommend people to do is to make sure that they have sufficient emergency funds so that you do not need to liquidate your investments prematurely during an unfortunate event. And fourthly, which is the most important one I feel, is that this guy changed his job eight times through job hopping. Okay, so that's the reality these days. Lah. If you feel that your current employer is sort of like explo exploiting you, not paying you enough, then maybe it's time to look for a higher paying job. And you may get a better experience. And also at the same time, you will increase your contributions to EPF. So let's work the math backwards over here. Lah. We can actually figure out how much you need to contribute every month to achieve 1 million ringgit by 45. Huh? And then what is this guy's average salary? Okay, so first of all, we have a look at EPF's 5-year analyzed return over here, 5.65%. To be a bit conservative, we will use 5.50%. Right? And after that, if we project it forward for 22 years, and then we put the final figure as 1 million, assuming 5.50% average returns, uh, you will need to contribute 1,948 ringgit every month. Okay, so with this figure itself, right, this monthly figure, you can actually determine uh, what is this guy's average salary. Yeah, assuming the mandatory contributions make up 24% of his salary, 11% from employee himself, 13% from employer, right? You take 1948, you divide it by 24%. This is, this is his average salary, 8,116 ringgit. Now, we cannot figure out what his current pay or his starting pay is, but hopefully it will give you a good idea as to how much you need to contribute every month in order to achieve 1 million ringgit uh, starting from zero. La. And obviously this is quite difficult to achieve because to have uh, 8,000 ringgit average salary, right? It's not going to happen okay, to a lot of Malaysians because right now Malaysians are severely underpaid. Very few people have this opportunity to receive such a, such a high amount of salary. right? But let's move on. Let's have a look at a bit of data first. The median savings of in EPF. So some good news over here, some good observations. Uh, total median savings from 2022 to 2023 increased by 30%. Chinese people saw their savings rising by 8.13% year on year basis. Indians saw their savings increase by 14.5% and Bumi Putras, their savings spiked by 65% uh, from 4,400 ringgit to 7,320 ringgit. But despite this positive observations, right, Bumi Putras, they have the least amount of savings uh, when it comes to the three main races. Uh. On average, Chinese people have six, time, six times more savings compared to Bumi Putras. And uh, this is a bit worrying. Uh. We may be just hit with a retirement crisis in the near future. And obviously, the big reason for this 
is due to the four EPF withdrawals approved by the government during the pandemic. And majority of them who withdrew from EPF during the emergency itself are uh, um, Bumi Putras, you know. You can see over here, six points, sorry, 6.62 million members, those people who have less than 10,000 ringgit in savings, 75% Bumi Putras. 3.2 million members, those who have critically low savings, 81% of them are Bumi Putras. And of course, some of the people who withdrew the money during that time, it was really an emergency. They needed to sustain their monthly expenses. And some people, they withdrew the money, they invest in other products such as gold, Bitcoin, the stock market, or maybe ASB in order to generate higher returns. But majority, majority of the people withdrew that money to spend on things that they do not absolutely need. Yeah, such as buying a new handbag or placing a down payment for a car that they do not need, etc. Okay, so this is why withdrawing from your EPF prematurely is not a good decision. Uh. Okay, so as much as possible, you want to let your money work for you. Okay, so moving on, uh, what about average savings? Okay, let's take a look at the age groups over here. Uh, a few good observations also. Uh, on average, the uh, savings increased by 5 to 7% for all age groups, yeah, 30 to 49. And younger people, those aged 25 to 29, uh, saw their savings increase by almost 20%. And with this data over here, right, we can actually project it forward for the next 20 to 30 years and determine how much you need to contribute every month in order to achieve 600,000 ringgit or 1 million ringgit. Let me just break it down for you. Lah, okay? All you need to do is take a look at your current age group and then let's say like me, you're 27 this year and have a look at your EPF account. Okay, So if your EPF account has a higher balance than the average savings, then you know you're well ahead of the curve. And then after that, make sure that your total contributions from you and your employer add up more to these, both of these figures over here. Okay, so let's say uh, 27 this year, average savings is 16,505. Uh, you and your employer will need to contribute somewhere between 560 to 766 in order to hit 600,000 ringgit by 55. Now, this is assuming uh, EPF pays 5.50% uh, per year. Okay, the figure that we used just now. Okay, Next, to achieve 1 million ringgit by the age of 55, you and your employer will need to contribute somewhere between 996 ringgit to 1,343 ringgit. Okay, so what if you're a bit older? If you're a bit older, then definitely hitting this 1 million ringgit target is significantly harder, right? So therefore, you should focus on a more realistic target first, which is 600,000 ringgit. And in that case, uh, you can see the figures over here, assuming that you have the average savings. Uh. But why 600,000 ringgit, you might ask? Why not 500,000? Why not 700,000? Well, because 600,000 ringgit is the minimum figure required to retire today based on the Belanjawan Ku study. Uh. Okay, so senior singles right now, they need about 2,520 ringgit per month to survive. So we round it down to 2.5k. Okay? And with 600,000 ringgit, right, assuming that EPF pays the low range, 5% per year, you receive 30,000 ringgit in dividends every year. So 30,000, you divide it by 12, just nice, you will get 2.5k every month. Okay, so uh, right now, if you're retiring soon in the next 5 to 10 years, try to aim for 600,000 ringgit first, then gradually work your way upwards to 1 million ringgit. Okay, but what about in the future, 20 to 30 years, how much will 1 million ringgit be worth? Well, in this case, we need to have a look at some data, in this case, inflation. Okay, so 2002 to 2022, Malaysia's inflation averaged 2.15%. I know it doesn't feel that way, but we'll just stick to the data and use this figure over here. And after that, we plug it into the present value calculator, which if you guys are familiar with math, you know what I'm talking about. You'll be able to find out how much will 1 million ringgit be worth in 5 years. In this case, 10% less. 10 years, almost 20% less. Huh? 15 years, 27.3% less. 25 years, 1 million ringgit will be worth 41.2% less. Okay, so in other words, uh, if you have 1 million ringgit in the near future, 25 years, and EPF pays 5%, every year you receive 50,000 ringgit, and then 50,000 ringgit divided by 12 is about 4.1k. Yeah, that 4.1k will be worth 41.2% less in today's money. Okay, and using the same formula, we can also determine how much uh, senior singles this minimum figure will inflate to 
in the near future. So 2.5k right now, sufficient enough to retire, right? The Belanjawan Gu study says. But in 20 years, at a mere 2.15% inflation every year, you will need at least 3,750 ringgit or 30 years, 4,638 ringgit every month. So if you want to understand how much you need in your EPF account, well, if you want to live off your dividends only, lah, only take the dividends, you do not want to deduct your capital, right? In this case, you need at least 900,000 ringgit in your EPF account or 1.1 million ringgit in the next 30 years. Yeah, so mark my words, uh, in uh, 20 to 30 years, this will be the minimum required to retire. Right now, let's move on over to taxes. Okay, so a lot of people have uh, misconceptions about the lifestyle relief, uh, which is why today I just wanted to do it on a presentation just to clarify some of the doubts. Uh, okay? So this lifestyle 2,500 ringgit, it covers a broad range of things. Uh, first of all being purchase and subscription of reading materials. Now reading materials, uh, it's any type of reading materials, whether it's ebook, uh, electronic or physical, all of it can be claimed as long as the material is not banned. And by the way, uh, this entire relief you can claim for yourself, your spouse or your children. Uh. The next one being purchase of personal computers, smartphones and tablets. These are the only three things that you can claim in this section of this relief. Uh. You cannot claim things like uh, tech gadgets such as keyboards, mouse, earphones and uh, other stuff also. Uh, okay? It has to be these three types of items only. Okay? Next being monthly bill payment for internet subscriptions. Let's say your Unify, your Maxis. As long as it's under your own name, you can claim it in this relief. Yeah, but what about SIM cards? What about telco plans with mobile data service? Well, in this case, if the plan only includes mobile data service, then you can claim it under this relief. But if the plan has mobile data service and talk time, then you cannot claim it. Yeah, because it is not purely an internet subscription anymore. Yeah, so hopefully, it clarifies some of the questions. Huh? Last one being purchase of sports equipment for sports activities under the Sports Development Act. Yeah, so it's important huh? if you are currently doing a sport, you know, such as Pilates or class passes or those type of new sports that are recently developed or recently created after 1997, huh? then you have to check the list whether it is in the Sports Development Act or not. Otherwise, it cannot be claimed. Okay, So those sports equipment, those equipment include things that with a very short lifespan, yeah, golf balls, shuttlecocks, badminton rackets, basketballs, uh, excluding motorized bicycles. Uh, okay, And payment for your gym memberships, you can also claim under this lifestyle relief, excluding club memberships that provide gym facilities. Yeah, Let's say you are currently uh, paying every month to a club and within that club it has a gym and also a swimming pool yeah you cannot claim the expenses in this relief huh? okay because it is only specifically for gym memberships and also there is an additional 500 ringgit relief on top of the 2.5k uh, for sports okay so any rental entrance fee to sports facilities any sports fac uh, facilities uh, you can claim for yourself your spouse or your children. So things like court fees, yeah, basketball, you rent out, you want you want to rent a court or whatsoever, yeah, all this can be claimed. And next one, payment for registration fee for any sports competition. Okay, again, it has to be under the Sports Development Act. Yeah, if you are in a sports that is not in the list, yeah, then most likely you cannot claim it. Okay, and again, you can claim it for your spouse or your children as well. So what are the things that you cannot claim? under the lifestyle relief well pilates and class passes because the first thing is just now we mentioned has to be uh, mentioned under the sports development act and unfortunately pilates is not one of them sports attire let's say your nike shoes your adidas shirts yeah, all of this fall under sports attire which you cannot claim tech gadgets like what i mentioned just now mouse keyboards right monitors okay all of this uh, cannot be claimed under the lifestyle relief. Club memberships and finally SIM cards with talk time. But we also talked about SIM cards just now. If it's a SIM card that has purely mobile data service only, yeah, then you can claim. Otherwise, uh, you cannot claim it under this lifestyle relief. Okay, so hopefully it clarifies some of the questions that you guys may have. And uh, that brings me to the end of my presentation tonight. Before I transition to the Q&A session, just want to quickly thank our members 
Andrew, Wendy, Edward, Alex, CC, Is, Ashad, Cave and Balls, Kelvin, Tommy, Jinkang, Adrian, Jess, Wenyan, Dean, Duhan, Sufi, Faris, Alan, Jackson, Ryzan, Hudson, G, Jeffrey, Lawrence, Lukman, Jack, YC, and Christy, as well as all of our learner members. But I do want to just elaborate more on this table over here because many of you guys are concerned. I received a few DMs also regarding this, saying that, hey, Shinji, I know you just you know recently posted about this table, but I'm so far away from 1 million ringgit. Are you, you know, this, does this table include the salary increment or bonuses or not? Well, here's the good thing, right? It does not. It does not include salary increments or bonuses. Or the fact that if you change jobs, you get a higher pay, then you'll definitely see a higher contribution, right? So don't be so worried if right now your monthly contributions is very low in order to achieve 1 million ringgit. Yeah, that's because you're currently employed in, a, I would say, a lower paying job yeah, because we're not so high skilled yet. But as you progress along your career, right, and your salary increases, then your monthly contributions will also significantly increase. And also, the calculations include contributions from you and your employer. So all you need to do is add up the total contributions as long as it is comfortably above this figure and you check your average savings. As long as it's above this average savings over here, then you know you're well on track to uh, achieving this 1 million ringgit by 55, which is the minimum required to uh, survive or retire comfortably in the next 20 to 30 years, lah, as I did the calculation over here. Uh, top time equals to prepaid in context of mobile plan. Ah, yes. Okay, prepaid and postpaid also. If the postpaid contains top time, okay, let's say your postpaid says something like uh, first first hour for the entire month, it's free. Then after that, you got to pay, right? Uh, then it's no longer free. Uh, okay, then you no longer can claim it under the tax relief. Lah, okay, because it states over here, the telco service has to include mobile data service. Yes, okay, and after that, if it has mobile data service and talk time, then you cannot claim it under the lifestyle relief already. If I've forgotten to declare income tax for the year assessment of 2022, what would be the right procedure? Well, the first thing is don't panic, okay, because you can still declare them uh, without any penalties. That's the best part, okay, because LHDN is currently running a special voluntary disclosure program from June 2023 until 31st May 2024. So you guys have about less than two months left uh, if you feel that you've underdeclared or have not correctly reported your tax income. Uh, you can use this opportunity to be honest and declare everything accordingly. Okay, so you can follow the procedure over here. So for new taxpayers, they state the steps over here. For existing taxpayers who have previously declared income but have not submitted some of, some of the other documents or whatnot, existing taxpayers who have previously declared income but still have unreported additional income. Yeah, all of this, you can follow the steps over here and uh, declare it voluntarily without any penalties. LHDM will accept them without prejudice. Uh. Okay, so uh, just a bit of good news for you guys. Uh. Curious, regarding inflation rate, is it always certain to be on an upward trajectory? As one who is currently doing personal voluntary contributions to EPF, are there other diverse options to reach at least the 600,000 mark? Okay, so I'll answer your first question first. Uh. Inflation rate, yes. It is almost always certainly going to be on an upward trajectory. Why is this the case? Well, because central banks print money. Right? Every year, there is an increased supply of money. Yeah, with the increased supply of money, you will definitely have inflation. Okay, because more amount of money purchasing the same amount of goods definitely will lead to price increases. Okay, and there's no avoiding this. Uh, the entire world is doing this. It's just a matter of which central bank is printing slower compared to other central banks. Right? So as one who is currently doing personal voluntary contributions, diverse options to reach at least 600,000. Well, there are many options, right? Depending on your own risk profile. Okay, so for those people who are closer to retirement, let's say right now you are probably 40 years old or even 45 years old, right? Uh, you definitely want to opt for lower risk options. You don't want to go all in on Bitcoin because Bitcoin is known to fluctuate very wildly. Yeah, I know Bitcoin has recently done very well, uh, but it's starting to go down again. Eh? Okay, so if you were to buy, if you were to buy somewhere over here, uh, right now you'll be down about uh, let's see, ten percent in less than five days. Okay, so it's pretty scary, like If you cannot handle this type of volatility, and if you're closer to retirement, then you definitely don't want to allocate too much into volatile assets like this or even the a stock market because stock market is known to be volatile, right? 
So if you're close to retirement, definitely EPF is one of the first options because sooner or later you'll be able to access the money and EPF's return every year is pretty consistent, right? Five to six percent, sometimes can go above six percent, right? And then the next option, uh, low risk options also include things like ASB, ASM, right? So uh, over here, I did write an article back in October, but it has been updated as of March uh, of the five best places to store your savings right now. And all of these options are low risk. Okay, so if you're a low risk investor, you may want to consider these few alternatives in order to you know, increase your diversification or your investments. Okay, so what if you're a high risk investor or if you're a medium risk investor, then you can start exploring things like uh, global markets, now stocks, not just local stocks, but uh, US stocks as well as Hong Kong stocks. In this case, I also wrote an article about this. Okay, And when it comes to investing in US stocks, right, what I mainly do is I only invest in ETFs, which I did explain over here also. Okay, I don't stock pick. Uh, specifically, I don't invest in companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, and I explained about this before because I'd rather invest in the entire US market. Now, why would you have the biggest company working for you, one of the biggest company working for you, such as Apple, when you can have 500 of the US biggest companies working for you, right? Yeah, all of this can uh, come through by investing in ETFs. Now. So generally, you determine your own risk profile first, and then after that, decide what sort of mix do you like. Do you like a mix of like US equities, some local bank stocks or whatnot? At the end of the day, it entirely depends on what sort of risk that you can take uh, considering your current age group and how far away you are from retirement. EPF provides ISRM program where you can register to get benefit. Yes, okay, this is a very good thing. Huh? If you guys are self-employed and if you guys are gig workers, okay, if you're not officially employed under uh, uh, an employer or whatnot, you can actually apply for ISRM. And the government will give you a 15% return for your EPF contributions up to 500 ringgit. Which is very juicy, lah. Okay, fifteen percent return is is quite nice. You know, you can see over here, receive special incentive of fifteen percent for total contribution up to a maximum of five hundred ringgit per for the current year, not per year. Ah. maybe next year they won't do it again, but hopefully next year they will. Uh, but if you are self-employed or if you are a gig worker, you are contributing voluntarily to EPF only. Okay, then make sure you uh, try and apply for ISR. Does our government apply tax on capital gains? Yeah. So if you earn any gains on shares let's say you buy local shares okay let's say like uh, maybank over here give you guys an example huh? in 2020 or whatever uh, 2020 or 2022 you bought maybank at let's say eight ringgit and right now maybank is 967 you're making a quite a juicy profit like maybe 22 uh, percent profit will the government tax you on this or not the answer is no uh. if, if you sell it you get capital gains but it is not taxed in malaysia this is a similar case for shares in the US as well. Okay, let's say you bought QQQ, which is a US ETF, at somewhere maybe at 300, 340 points. Okay, and then after that you decided to sell it at the 20, 20 to 30 percent gain. Right here, you won't be you won't be taxed. Yeah, because capital gains is not subjected to tax in Malaysia. But if you invest in US shares and those US shares pay dividends, then you will be subjected to a dividend withholding tax. Okay. So if these US companies pay you dividends, right, uh, you'll be taxed up to 30%. Uh, it is under the withholding tax. La. Thank you guys so much for joining me tonight. And I hope you guys enjoyed this session. Hopefully you guys learned something. La. And uh, if you want additional benefits, again, you can join our Patreon membership. I think the most affordable package only comes in at one US dollar per month. All right, guys. I will see you guys in the next session. Bye. Good night. Stay safe.